across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker. This is Times Radio. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Matt Shirley. This is Times Radio. In a moment, PMQ's on PAP. But first, the headlines this lunchtime. The Health Secretary says nationwide contingency plans have not been put in place by the unions whose members are striking from the ambulance service today. Steve Barclay says it will be a challenging day. The GMB union says its uh, lives are at risk every day because of staff shortages, not just on strike days. Trade unions have been told, have told MPs they'll continue strike action for as long as it takes to get a fair pay deal. Mike Whelan, the boss of ASLE, told the Transport Committee the chance of resolution was zero, adding we're further away than when we started. Uh, and uh, we will bring you a full news update at uh, half past. Uh, but now uh, it's time for this. PMQ's Unpacked on Times Radio. Unpacking the politics and cutting through the crossfire. Order, order. I call Matt Chorley and Tim Shipman. Yeah, get online to the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, go online to YouTube, search Times Radio. You can see uh, Tim Shipman in the big chair. I'm live from the spare room, uh, bringing you PMQs unpacked, even even when the trains conspire uh, for us to not do it. Tim Shipman, how are you? Well, it's a very comfortable chair, isn't it? I could get used to this. Well, give it time, Tim. Give it time. Only a matter of time. Um, uh, the last few, it feels like forever, uh, Keir Starmer's gone on the NHS and strikes. Um, uh, do you think he'll do that this week? Or are there, there seem to be more political threads he could pull out this week? Uh, well, there are, but um, he seems quite keen on this one and it's not going away. And the more I talk to MPs and even some people in the government, they're getting a bit uneasy about quite how long this is going on for. So um, I was going to say I'd go on strike if he doesn't do strikes. Um, but um, uh, it seems the most likely area to me. And this, uh, I mean, you talk about different threads. There's so many different threads he could go on with the strikes. We've got, um, uh, you know, nurses going out again. The ambulance workers are supposed to be... Uh, announcing they're going on strike later. We've still got issues with trains um, and there's a whole host of other things going on too. So he doesn't just have to stick to the NHS. He can uh, roam across the piece here. Um, uh, and the government are still trying to push back. You've got Steve Barclay out today saying, you know, if you cut, if you start giving more money to the nurses, it's going to cut patient care. But quite whether that argument is going to wash with MPs or the public um, uh, remains to be seen. But... Um, you know, Starmer's capable of doing anything, but it seems to me he's uh, he's most likely to do, go with that again. Um, uh, do you think, I mean, if I was here, but this might be the week to do the old William Hague trick of jumping around a whole load of issues, then try to th- find a theme that ties them together, whether it's rows over Brexit laws, backing down on the online harms bill, the, 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 the row over transgender legislation with Scotland, sort of tying it all together and everything is a bit of a mess, rather than just grinding your way through Six six questions on strikes. Well, I remember back, um, you know, before the summer, we were talking about, you know, how does he tie together a sort of theme of... Um, the Tories used to talk about broken Britain, um, and there's a slight sense of nothing works at the moment, and that could be a theme that pulls all of those things together. Uh, but I'd be surprised if strikes wasn't part of that, being the most sort of high-profile and um, public-facing bit of uh, of a lot of this stuff. Um, and some of those things you mentioned are a little bit... Uh, dangerous for Keir Starmer. I'm, I'd be surprised if he wants to get into transgender wars, to be perfectly honest with you, even however much he might care about uh, the union and uh, wanting to win some Scottish votes by saying the government's behaving in a heavy-handed manner on that. Um, he's likely to have what is a woman thrown at him if he does that. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's potentially dangerous. And I would have thought Rishi Sunak is keeping up his sleeve some jokes about um, uh, Keir Starmer going to Davos, which Rishi Sunak is not doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, you may well uh, be right. Uh, well, here we, I think we're ready to go. Keir Starmer, uh, we should say, I think he made a, a, a short statement at the beginning uh, of PMQ today about uh, David Carrick of the Metropolitan uh, Police. There's more on that. We'll bring it to you. You can watch along, as ever, on the Times Radio YouTube channel. I'm just having a look at some of the comments where you're all watching. Pennsylvania, Cape Town, Grand Canaria, Frosty Guildford, Rotherham. Upstate New York, Maydevale, Leicester, Germany, Wiltshire. You're all you're all tuning in. Uh, lots of you asking, what's this picture behind me on the wall? Uh, that's the uh, that's a uh, reproduction of the very first copy of the Times. 
uh, which was then the Daily Universal Register. Very good uh, on brand there, Matthew. Very on brand. You see, I've taken down all the other pictures that were on the spare room. Uh, very good. Right, let's go live to the House Commons then. This is question number one. PMQs and Pat from Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in his comments about the dreadful case of Carrick? Mr Speaker, it's three minutes past 12. If somebody phones, if somebody phones 999 now because they have chest pains and fear it might be a heart attack, when would the Prime Minister expect an ambulance to arrive? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, it's absolutely right that people can rely on the emergency services when they need them, and that's why we are rapidly implementing measures to improve the delivery of ambulance times and, indeed, urgent and emergency care. But I'd say to the honourable gentleman, if he cares about ensuring that patients get access to life-saving emergency care when they need it, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? Oh, slightly familiar uh, territory, uh, Tim Shipman, from last week. Uh, an interesting, uh, an interestingly framed question from Keir Starmer, even if he got the same usual answer from Rishi Sunak. Yeah, no, um, uh, I mean, I hate to say, you know, being proved right. Um, this could be a long <laughs> half an hour, couldn't it? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, as we've been saying over the last few weeks, Starmer, um, Starmer's team are getting a bit better at sort of framing something in an edgy fashion. Um and that's a better way of saying, you know, um, ambulance times are a disaster. Uh, you know, uh, probe him, um, tease him a bit, uh, ask him the price of a, a pint of milk, etc. Um, and he's, um, you know, it, it makes the sort of non-answer sound worse if you've asked him a pretty straight answer, uh, which everybody knows um, uh, the answer would be a bad one if he were to answer it honestly. Yeah, and it's one of the things that comes up all the time. People ask, uh, yeah, in, I'm sure the comments will start coming in saying he, uh, he doesn't ask, answer a straight question. Let's go back then to the House of Commons. Question number two. Let's see if Keir Starmer has any more luck on his second go. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister could deflect all he likes, but for the person, for the person suffering from chest pains, the clock started ticking straight away. Every minute counts. Yeah. That's why the government says an ambulance should be there in 18 minutes. In that case, it would mean just about 20 past 12. Now, I, don't, I know he doesn't want to answer the question I asked him, so I'm going to ask him again. When will that ambulance arrive? Yeah, yeah. M Mr Speaker... Mr Speaker, because of the extra funding we're putting in to relieve pressure in urgent and emergency care departments, because of the investment we're putting in in ambulance call handling, we will improve ambulance times as we are recovering from the pandemic and indeed the pressures of this winter. But I say to the Honourable Gentleman again, because he makes my case for me, he describes the life-saving care that people desperately need. So why? When in other countries like France, Spain, Italy and others, why is he depriving people here that care? Uh, Rishi Sinan getting quite a lot of heckling from uh, Angela Rayner on, on the Labour front bench there. I mean, I suppose uh, it may well be the point that Keir Starmer might make um, uh, in a moment. But th the point is that people are waiting a phenomenal length of time for ambulances, even when there isn't strike action, Tim. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, there's two issues here, and 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 Sunak's conflating them. Um, I frankly, I think he'd be better advised in this situation to just go for it honestly and say, look, these ambulance times are not good enough. Which is precise, precisely, you know, and explain a bit, make his case about why some of that's too, he would doubtless say is down to the pandemic um, and and uh, the fact that you know we've had an economic uh, uh, disaster zone over the last um, sort of uh, year or so, and he could make that case and say, look, we've get we're trying to get to grips with it. This is precisely why I've set up this uh, ambulance time dashboard. It's precisely why the Secretary of State for Health is doing X, Y, and Z, um, and try and own it a bit, and then then he can make his point that you know and what's making them worse frankly are these strikes and and we need minimum service levels uh, in these situations uh, to, to try and cope with that um but sort of uh, kind of pretending that there isn't a problem i mean he's not pretending there isn't a problem he just doesn't want to answer the question um and starmer if he's got any sense actually now having done it twice will probably keep going this could well be a sort of uh, jeremy paxman quizzing michael howard scenario we might get all six questions asking when the ambulance is going to turn up 
That, that, I mean, in a way, this is this is going to be quite a good test for for Keir Starmer because the smart you're right. The smart thing to do now is to just keep doing it, all six questions, uh, and then put it together into a social media clip, and you might get on the board. Yeah, and journalists that. do or, this in in the in the lobby briefing. Sometimes they'll keep asking, and they'll keep mentally totting up how many times Downing Street has refused to say something, and then everyone walks out of the meeting and says, "Well, what was that six, eight times?" And then immediately the story becomes, you know, that becomes Downing story, Street refused say, seven yeah, yeah. times to say X, um, <laughs> and he can, you know, maybe pull that. Off here, but we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, loads of you, loads of you posted comments uh, on the YouTube channel about how uh, not getting answers to question. Although someone says, uh, Glenn says, could anyone make a heart attack sound less interesting than Keir Starmer? Uh, uh, someone called Matt says that's not an answer. Uh, so, oh, so the Times Radio um, YouTube uh, team uh, seem to think the picture I've taken down off the wall was a picture of, uh, of Andrew Bridget, which is a separate issue altogether. <laughs> uh, let's go back. Let's go back to the House of Commons then. This is what question three from Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, he obviously doesn't know or doesn't care. I'll tell him. If our heart attack victim had called for an ambulance in Peterborough at 12.03, it wouldn't arrive until 10 past two. Yep. These are our constituents waiting for ambulances I'm talking about. Yep. If it was Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until... Order, order, order. Mr Blister, I hope you want to see the rest of the questions out, because I want you to be here, but you're going to have to be here better. Come on, Mr Starmer. Mr Speaker, I'm talking about our constituents. If they were in Northampton, it wouldn't arrive until 20 past two. If they were in Plymouth, it wouldn't arrive until 20 to three. That's why... Someone who fears a heart attack waiting more than two and a half hours for an ambulance. Not the worst case scenario, just the average wait. Yep. So for one week, will he stop blaming others, take some responsibility and just admit under his watch the NHS is in crisis, isn't it? Well, Mr Speaker, I noticed the one place the honourable gentleman didn't mention was Wales. Where we know ambulance times are even worse than they are in England, Mr. Speaker. No, and the reason, the reason that is the case, because this is not about politics. This is about the fact that the NHS in Scotland, in Wales, in England, is dealing with unprecedented challenges, recovering from COVID, dealing with a very virulent and early flu season, and everyone is doing their best to bring those wait times down. But again, I'll ask him. If he believes so much in improving ambulance wait times, why won't he support our minimum safety legislation? <laughs> well, that's the I'm answer surprised. he could have given, you know, some moments ago, as they say. Um, yes, I think you're right. So, so Keir Starmer not taking our advice to, to ring this out for the full mistakenly, uh, six I think, questions. as a result of I that. Think, yeah. I, I think you're probably right, given how uh, how cross, uh, yeah, the response. Should we read anything into the places that the, uh, Keir Starmer was picking? Peterborough, that's probably a la Labour target, isn't it? North, it's a, it's was it a North nice, mar was nice marginal one? seat. Um, yeah, Northampton, Plymouth, there's, there's marginals in Plymouth, aren't there? These are all places which uh, will be in play at the next election um, and um, Labour would be hoping to make uh, further inroads um, in those kind of places. So... Yeah, and actually, you know, the wait times are obviously pretty shocking, and that's that's you know that's a good way of um, ending a third question if you're intending to move on to something slightly different. Um, but just sort of saying the NHS is in crisis, isn't it? Um, that's not a particularly strong way of moving the debate on or forcing Sunak into a corner because he's never going to answer yes to that. Um, though actually, he sort of did. Um, and kind of said, you know, firstly, we thought, oh, gosh, he's going to just fall back on Tories, say everything's terrible in Wales, which is run by the Labour Party. But but then he did give a quite, you know, the answer I thought he should have given before, which is, you know, let's be grown up about this. There is a there's a big old crisis everywhere. Um, and this is why. Um, and I think, um, you know, the Tory MPs quite liked that. That was, a, a you know, in, in what is a pretty unpleasant sticky wicket. Um, he managed to find the boundary with that one. It's interesting that um, while we've been talking, Labour Party just put out a press release, actually, 37,000 patients with conditions like heart attacks and strokes waited more than three and a half hours for an ambulance in December. So, so that, again, further sign, actually, the Labour Party getting their their, their act together, uh, you know, trying to land an overall story. But you're right, rather than the main story coming out of PMQs, that Keir Starmer thinks the NHS is a mess. 
Um, but as a result, I suspect we're going to hear more on this if that's their big uh, press release offer. Uh, so let's go back to the House of Commons. Uh, question number four now from Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, he won't answer any questions and he won't take any responsibility. By one o'clock, our heart attack victim is in a bad way. Sweaty, dizzy, chest tightening. This is a heart attack and they're shouting, this is your constituent. By that time, they should be getting treatment. But an hour after they've called 999, they're still lying there, waiting, listening to the clock tick. How does he think they feel knowing an ambulance could be still hours away? Well, Mr Speaker, the specific and practical things we are doing to improve ambulance times are clear. We are investing more in urgent and emergency care to create more bed capacity. We are ensuring that the flow of patients through emergency care is faster than it ever has been. We are discharging people at a record rate out of hospitals to ease the constraints that they are facing. And we are reducing the call-out rates by moving people out of ambulance stacks and being dealt with in a community. Now, these are all very practical steps that will make a difference in the short term. But I ask him again and again, and we know why. The reason that he is not putting patients first when it comes to ambulance waiting times is because he is simply in the pockets of his union paymaster. Hey, I haven't got my bell, but um, you... <laughs> Union paymaster. No, it's, it's it'll be it. in the drawer. It's under lock and key when I'm not there, Tim. Oh. Um, Union paymaster. Somebody on uh, somebody on uh, the YouTube channel said we haven't had that yet. So at least we've at least we can now um, tick that. That's one off. a full bingo I'm, card, isn't it? I think that, that's yeah. I'm 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 a bit disappointed. I thought we might have been on for some some sort of new uh, uh, performative high from uh, Keir Starmer, but he's still he's still taking us through the. The process of calling an ambulance when you've had a heart attack in a quite laborious way, each one ending with it's terrible, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm getting chest pains sitting here listening to it, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> and wondering, you know, fortunately, Guy's Hospital is just is within a stone's throw of here. So, uh, uh, no, it's, um, you know, in a sense, he's continuing at least to lace this all together in a way that we thought that he perhaps should. I think he, he almost uh, peaked too early with question three, but... Um, you know, he's got everybody uh, um, uh, feeling their pulses and uh, hoping for the best in the chamber. Um, and do you think, I'll probably ask you this every week, this landing the argument about union paymasters and Labour and the party we've talked about, they put Keir Starmer in Mick Lynch's pocket and all of that, is that landing? But actually we've got what momentum, the old Corbyn left-wing uh, paramilitary arm of the Labour Party, as it once was, protesting that Keir Starmer's not left-wing enough. Not nearly enough in the pockets of his union paymasters. Uh, no, I mean, I think my judgment is that instinctively it's not the argument that it once was. Um, uh, when you're dealing with Starmer rather than Corbyn or, you know, even back in the days of Ed Miliband, um, it wasn't an argument that ever really worked with Tony Blair. Um, it might have worked a bit better with Gordon Brown. But more to the point, we're 12 years into a Conservative government and, and all this kind of carping, I think, generally has less of an effect on the public. I, I think it's probably still worthwhile Sunak doing it because um, where it is popular is with a lot of his MPs. And, you know, as we always say, half the job of a Prime Minister um, at PMQs is to walk out, you know, with his shirt still on his back um, and... Uh, you know, sending his MPs away thinking that he's vaguely competent yeah, yeah. And, and is not being sort of torn asunder by the opposition. Um, so it cheers them up a little bit, but I think, uh, you know, speaking to a lot of them, they know that this is not a particularly potent argument with the public anymore. Yeah, and they're still slightly um, uh, trying to find uh, something to, to, to go at him. You know, all the old playbook they've used on Ed Miliband and Jeremy Corbyn just doesn't seem to be landing uh, quite as well this time. Well, let's go back. What are we up to? Question number five, I think, uh, from Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, this isn't hypothetical. This is real life. Stephanie from, Ply <laughs> Stephanie from Plymouth was battling cancer when she collapsed at home. Her mum rang 999, desperate for help. She only lived a couple of miles from the hospital but they couldn't prioritise her. She was 26 when she died waiting for that ambulance. 
a young woman whose life was ended far too soon. And as a dad, I can't even fathom that pain. So, on behalf of Stephanie and her family, will you stop the excuses, stop shifting the blame, stop the political games, and simply tell us when will he sort out these delays and get back to the 18-minute wait? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, of course Stephanie's case is a tragedy. Of course, people are working as hard as they can to ensure people get the care they need. But he talks about political games. He is a living living example of playing political games when it comes to people's health care. I've already mentioned what's been going on in Wales. Is he confident in the Labour-run Wales NHS that nobody is suffering right now? Of course they are, Mr Speaker, because the NHS everywhere is under pressure. What we should be doing is supporting those doctors and nurses to make the changes that we are doing to bring the care to those people. But I'll ask him this. If he is so, so concerned, so concerned about making sure that the Stephanies of the future get the cares they need, why? Why is he denying those families the guarantee of emergency life-saving care? I mean, Keir Stoneman did a good job there of humanising what up until that point had become a, a slightly technocratic, as it sometimes is the case with him, uh, talking about this uh, Stephanie, 26-year-old uh, cancer patient from Plymouth, died while waiting for an ambulance uh, only 2.3 miles uh, from the hospital. Um, and actually, Rishi Sunak, by again bringing up Wales, sort of conceded by implication that the NHS in England is a, is is in trouble as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, I mean, that's the classic old trick, isn't it? You you come up with a specific individual case. We've been doing this for uh, ever since the War of Jennifer's Ear, um, uh, which some of uh, the older listeners may um, remember. Um, back in 1992, I think that one was. Um, and it's always, you know, uh, it's always telling when you can point to a specific case. Jeremy Corbyn, of course, hung whole sessions of PMQs on individual cases like this. Um, Sunak... Um, I was wondering how sort of empathetic he'd be in his reply. Um, I think perhaps more than he is sometimes, perhaps less than uh, the sort of uh, the Bill Clintons and Tony Blairs of this world managed to do in situations like that. Um, uh, So, you know, he did okay in his response. Um, I think, again, by talking about political games, Starmer kind of left the door open there for Sunak to kind of hit him back on the uh, the same theme. uh, because, you know, uh, PMQs by definition is political games and, you know, we're having an argument about, uh, you know, again, Starmer's the sort of final part of his um, uh, of his question was, I thought, not particularly strong. I mean, he's kind of talking about, you know, uh, saying, you know, how long is this going to go on? When are you going to get to grips with this? Um, you know, and Sunak can quite reasonably say that you know they they are trying to get to grips with it it's uh, it's not a sort of question that's ever going to receive um a coherent or sensible answer even even it'd be better if you know you're not going to get an answer make the question better yeah, exactly if, the, if your question is this is all awful isn't it he's never going to say yes so at least try and for you know you can make a political point with the question exactly which is what he did at the start with the, how long yeah. does it take for this ambulance to arrive um i think he just needs to be more more precise about it um you know there is a sort of a tendency uh, generally on the left i think to just say isn't everything terrible um uh, which is fine because a lot of people agree with that but um it's not what wins you a session of pmqs i don't think Interesting point Tom Saunders has posted on the uh, on the YouTube channel. If health workers are working as hard as they can, as Richie Sunak just said, where does that leave Steve Barclay's demands for productivity increases in the NHS? And this and this has been really latched on by critics on the left. That Steve Barclay basically told people in the NHS to work a bit harder. Um, or I suppose all of that really points to the government to some extent thrashing around constantly to an answer to questions, which are where well, the answer is actually uh, the NHS has been underfunded. Uh, social care has not been reformed. Uh, we haven't got enough staff. And uh, the fallout of the pandemic means that lots of people have 
uh, stored up illnesses which are putting massive pressures on the NHS. Well, that's right. But I also think anyone who's been anywhere near um, uh, the hospital in the last six months, um, and I've got young kids, which means, you know, this happens from time to time, can see that everybody is working absolutely flat out. It's not like the individuals there are not working. When you talk about productivity problems in the NHS, you know, do we get our money's worth from the money that goes in? You know, there's a lot of evidence that we don't, and that's more about how the NHS is run. Um, and in... Uh, a country that isn't Great Britain, you'd be having a debate about exactly how uh, the NHS works. Um, but unfortunately, because it's this sort of national religion, um, it's very difficult to do that here. So while a lot of Conservatives occasionally, at moments when their tails are up, think, well, we'll go off and reform the NHS, they, um, any time they get anywhere near an election, they, they bottle it spectacularly. Um, and frankly, it's, um, I think, encouraging that Wedge Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, is making noises about lack of productivity as well, because really um, it's it's the Labour Party that has to reform the NHS generally because they're trusted by the public uh, not to be sort of privatising it and tearing it up. Um, and it's very difficult for a Conservative government to do that uh, with any credibility. It's a little bit then, do you think, with what, 18 months probably from a general election? If we were close to a general election, we'd probably be saying that Keir Starmer... Uh, you know, is massively more trusted on the NHS than the Tories are. Having away at them doesn't really help him especially, and we'd actually be looking for some meat on some on the bones of, well, what would you do instead? But also, politically, you want to target some of the areas where you want to show, the, you know, improve your strength and undermine the Conservative position. It's quite easy, easy, easy pickings, this, isn't it? Just this is a home the tie the for the Labour Party, generally speaking. Yeah. And, you know, and if Sunak was honestly answering, he'd say, of course I want to sort this out because I want to get re-elected and I've made five pledges to the public, one of which is to get waiting times down, um, tackle ambulances. Um, so, you know, the honest political answer is that, you know, they're desperate to sort this out and they're chucking everything at the wall apart from giving the staff more money at the moment. Um and, um, you know, that's where, what the situation is. Uh, you know, I don't begrudge Starmer the opportunity to attack on something that is clearly, um, you know, disturbing yeah, yeah. and worrying. But as you say, strategically, he will need to do more than just bang on about the NHS in the next 18 months. Well, let's find out um, how he winds all this up uh, before we, uh, <laughs> before we uh, go to the news. Uh, this is uh, the last question then. Question number six from Keir Starmer. So that's his answer to yep. Stephanie's family. Yep. Deflect, yep. blame others, yep. never take responsibility. Yep. Just like last week, he won't say when he's going to deliver the basic minimum service levels people need. Yep. Mr Speaker, over the 40 minutes or so that these sessions tend to last, 700 people will call an ambulance. Two will be reporting a heart attack. Four will be reporting a stroke. But instead of the rapid help they need, many will wait and wait and wait. So if he won't answer any questions, will he at least apologise for the lethal chaos under his watch? Yeah. M M M Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, he, uh, he asks about the minimum safety levels. We, we will deliver them as soon as we can pass them. Why won't he vote for them, first of all? But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are we are delivering on the people's priorities. As we've seen this week, the honourable gentleman will just say anything if the politics suits him. It's as simple as that. He will break promises left, right, and centre. He promised to nationalise public services. He promised to have a second referendum. He promised to defend the mass migration of the EU. And now we're apparently led to believe that. He... Oh, oh, I expect the front bench just to keep a little quiet, because if they don't, there's somewhere else for them to shout their noise. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if we are going to deliver for the British people, people need to have strong convictions. But when it comes to the honourable gentleman, he isn't just for the free movement of people, he's also got the free movement of principles. <laughs> oh, that's... Uh... Ooh. After a gag-free, pre, you know, soundbite-free uh, six questions, go on, wow. so you winced at that. <laughs> uh, the, the free movement of people, the free movement of principles. It's it's oh. a it's 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 a sort of okay inside the Beltway joke. I doubt we're going to be hearing uh, much of that. Um, uh, but also, it would made it about slightly more sense if Keir Starmer had gone on immigration or small boats or something. That at least 
free movement of people that would have been, you know, adjacent to the well, conversation. Maybe we will hear it again when we when we do the yeah, next immigration agree. one. Um, uh, when why won't he apologise for the lethal chaos? Was a better question from Keir Starman than some of the earlier ones. Well, it's better because the phrase is quite good. Lethal chaos is a good phrase. Um, um, I'm not sure it was ever going to elicit an answer, um, and I'm not sure it quite pinned him down. But um, you know, as you say, delivering a soundbite in a question—that's what he did there. And um, I think we'll be hearing that phrase again um, because it can yeah. apply to a heck of a lot of different things, and and it contributes to that notion that you know stuff just isn't working very well at the moment in this country. Um, and that is, you know, easily Labour's trump card at the moment. Um, and however much Rishi Sunak. Um, can say, look, we're trying to do this, we're trying to do that. Um, he knows um, that if by the end of the year these numbers have not shifted, both on the economy and on the health service and on immigration, um, he's got problems. And, um, you know, his only chance of getting uh, elected in 2024 is if uh, they've managed to move the metrics a bit. But, you know, between then and uh, now and then we're going to have a, a long old series of um, PMQs which are going to be ploughing very similar furrows to this, I think. Yeah, it does still feel like the Labour Party are really still groping around for that phrase that ties all of that together. You know, everything's broken, Britain isn't working, whatever it might, you know, once it feels like once they've latched onto that, and maybe they have already know what it is and they'll wheel it out close to a general election, but that, it feels like it'd be much easier for Keir Starmer to, to sort of pull these things together rather than deciding this week I'm going to do the NHS isn't working very well, next week I might do the trains aren't whatever. You know, having having that that phrase which... You yeah, know, you could needs then to be a, do what Haig did a, a and take just jump control around. Or whatever it might be. Here, there yeah. and everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I know that we'll turn to it uh, next week. Right, up next we will bring you uh, the best of the rest, the other questions from the backbenchers and, of course, Stephen Flynn from the SNP. If you're watching along on the YouTube channel... Uh, you might notice I've now got a picture of Andy Bridgen on the wall. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, if you get on the YouTube channel. I'll see if I can go and find the dog. Uh, while we get, uh, uh, yeah, while we, while we have uh, the very latest news, here's a news update. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker, this is Times Radio. Times Radio News, this is Steve Holden. Kyiv's mayor has called a helicopter crash that killed the Minister of Internal Affairs in Ukraine a tragedy. The minister is among at least 16 people who've died after the helicopter crashed by a nursery in a suburb. The first deputy minister was also killed, as well as three children. Rishi Sunak has told MPs that David Carrick's crimes were a truly sickening abuse of power and promised police reform so offenders would have no place to hide. The former Met Police officer admitted 49 offences this week against women, including 24 rapes. His Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary says trust in the police is at its lowest level he can remember in his 36-year career. Andy Cook has been speaking to the Home Affairs Select Committee of MPs. And no individual should be allowed anywhere near a police uniform um, who is uh, that way inclined. And policing needs to get better at rooting out these individuals earlier. The cost of living fell slightly in December. It's the second month in a row that it's dipped and offers some evidence that the peak of the cost of living crisis has passed. Fuel and clothing were lower, although food costs are still rising. The Chancellor says there's still a long way to go. Nurses are striking in England today. They want better job retention, pay and improvements to patient safety. It comes as one in three NHS nurses and midwives say they would not go into their profession again if they had a choice. That's according to a poll from YouGov. The weather remaining cold this afternoon with chances of rain and sleet for some northern areas. Most inland areas are likely to be fine and sunny. Now with a sports update, here's Kane Reeves. Emma Raducanu has been knocked out of the Australian Open after losing in straight sets to Coco Goff. The British number one, ranked 70 places below Goff, grew into the match and was the better player. Former US Open champion is yet to make it past the second round of a Grand Slam since her New York heroics. Elsewhere, Rafael Nadal admitted he felt mentally destroyed after the defense of his title ended in injury and defeat by American Mackenzie McDonald. Nadal says he's unsure about the extent of his injury. I don't know what's going on, if it's muscle, if it's joint. I have a history in the hip that uh, had issues. It's difficult to to make a resolution if it's the muscle, if it's the, the joint. 
if it's the cartilage, I don't know. I lost the match, uh, that's it, I tried till the end. I don't know if in good conditions I will win the match. I will have better chances without a doubt, but uh, at the end, that's it. Uh, I. I just tried, it was not possible. It's understood the Glazer family, who own Manchester United, are eager to sell the club for £8 billion. The Times revealed yesterday that Ineos, owned by Sir Jim Ratcliffe, has entered the bidding process to buy United. Football finance expert Kieran Maguire doesn't believe the Glazers will receive the amount they're looking for. It's a bigger club than Chelsea, but it's not three times as big a club as Chelsea. It's not 30 times as big as, as Newcastle, which went for, you know, for 300 million. So um, I think we'd probably be looking for somewhere in the region of four to five billion, including the debt. You can read more on this story and more on Emma Raducanu's exit from the Australian Open by visiting the Times website and app. This is Times Radio. Sweden is known for... Across the UK, on DAB Digital Radio, on the free Times Radio app, and via your smart speaker. Matt Chorley on Times Radio. Very good afternoon to you, Matt Chorley on Times Radio. Still live on YouTube, where, uh, during the news, as well as listening to the news, uh, you were able to watch uh, my dog, Poppy. You don't need uh, me at all now, do you? Lot, lot, lots of you seem to enjoy that. They seem to enjoy it more than just see, watching you and I. Scratching our nose, uh, as we normally do, Tim. Poppy's a real therapy dog, says Glenn. Poppy makes the better questions. Poppy means quality radio. Oh, I see. They're all PMQs. Poppy means quality uh, radio, which is very nice. Uh, and someone else said, I can't believe I'm sitting watching a dog. Uh, I can't believe I'm sat watching a dog sat still on YouTube. Better than a cat, though. Is correct. Is correct. Right, anyway, let's return to PMQs unpacked. Um, we uh, go back to the House of Commons now. As ever, we kick off with the, uh, the leader of the SNP, in Westminster. This is a question from Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear. This is the Conservative Party seeking to stoke a culture war against some of the most marginalised people in society. And Scotland's democracy is simply collateral damage. And on that issue of democracy, let's reflect. Because on Monday, the UK government introduced legislation to ban the right to strike against the express wishes of the Scottish Government. On Tuesday, they introduced legislation to overturn the GRR against the express wishes of the Scottish Government. And this evening, they will seek to put in place legislation that rips up thousands of EU protections against the express wishes of the Scottish Government. Are we not now on a slippery slope from devolution to direct rule. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 Mr. S no, Mr. Speaker. Of course we're not. This is simply about protecting UK-wide legislation, about ensuring the safety of women and children. This is not about the devolution settlement. I would urge the honourable gentleman and his party to consider engaging with the UK government on this bill as we did before the legislation passed, so that we can find a constructive way forward in the interests of the people of Scotland and the United Kingdom. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's jump in there, uh, Tim. I'm not sure the slip of the tongue. I think Stephen Flynn went from saying from the express wishes of the Scottish people to the express wishes of the Scottish government. Which I know the SNP uh, think are interchangeable. <laughs> um, uh, but not necessarily everyone in Scotland would agree with. And I suppose that's a, an interesting way to view all of these separate rows we've been seeing between uh, Rishi Sinak and Nicola Sturgeon. Bearing in mind, he was only up there, what, last week with his casual jumper on. Um, and we were told they got on uh, famously well. Um, 
that actually anything which the SNP can use to drive a wedge and say Westminster is going against the express wishes of the Scottish people uh, helps to serve their their call for independence, regardless of whatever the issue might be. Yeah, that's right. And and direct rule is a very loaded term, which is obviously more often used for. Um, uh, London running things in Northern Ireland, uh, it has a sort of whiff of uh, uh, a sort of uh, colonial uh, thing about it. I have a Scottish friend who's still to this day, he's a massive unionist, but he refers to London as the imperial capital. And that's the, the view that, um, uh, you know, that the SNP are trying to get across that, you know, uh, we are um, sitting here and being told what to do um, by these terrible Tories in London. Um, uh, but as you rightly observe, um, uh, it's not always the case that the Scottish people and the Scottish government are in agreement on these things. Um, and it's a difficult one because some of this stuff, um, you have UK-wide legislation, there are issues which are not devolved matters um, under the settlement. Um, and, um, you know, it's incumbent on the government to ensure that the same rights exist in uh, in Edinburgh as they do in Isha. Um, but obviously that gives the SNP an opening. And, um, you know, uh, we've seen this at PMQs for a long time, um, you know, they're very good at exploiting it, getting their sound bite. Um, and Stephen Flynn is, if anything, I think a little bit sharper and less, um, uh, perhaps <laughs> slightly less verbose than his predecessor. Less ponderous, ponderous, I think, is probably Ian Blackford's, you know, uh, using eight words where one would do. Uh, it's a bit sharper and, uh, and to the point. Um, and, and but I suppose what Richard Sunak doesn't do, uh, or as much as perhaps he could, is sort of use it as a way of, launching a fierce defence of the Union, why it is good for Scotland. Yeah, and actually um, you got a little bit more of that from Boris Johnson, ironically, mm. um, who would sort of taunt and say, you know, it's all daft, this independence lark. But he did then get um, slightly under Michael Gove's tutelage to the point where he was making a positive case, you know, uh, Boris Johnson's big thing, of course, was the vaccine rollout, and that was a you know that was a stone cold example of why being in the union was a good thing for the people of Scotland, and he was able to exploit that for several months as as a big attack line against the SNP. Um, uh, be interesting to see, you know, Sunak has stolen some of Johnson's greatest hits in other areas. Um, he hasn't yet done so in this, and uh, it's one where you would think there ought to be a bit more continuity between um, those two Tory regimes. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, people don't always like using their predecessors' arguments. But we had the whole Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn thing. We've had, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, union paymasters is a hardy perennial. Um, I think there's more scope for Sunak to try and uh, make the argument in his answer, as you say. Uh, th right, that was uh, Stephen, uh, the exchange with Stephen Flynn. I'm not sure, where, where are we going next? Where do we want to go next? Uh, we're going to go to Alicia Cairns. She's the Conservative MP. Uh, who also chairs the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Let's see what she had to say. Speaker, if I may, I would like to begin by putting on record this House's heartbreak at the tragic death this morning of our friend Dennis, the Minister of Interior Affairs in Ukraine, and his deputy, and all those who were killed in that tragic accident. I'm sure this <coughs> House is united in our feeling on that. Turning to more local affairs, as many have pointed out, the government, I understand, is in the final furlongs of giving out its levelling up bids. And I must ask him to look kindly upon building the borough market of the Midlands and building a future Meditech hub in Rutland. So can he assure me that not just urban, but also rural areas will be levelled up? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, let me join with my honourable friend in in paying tribute to the family of the Interior Minister in Ukraine. I know our thoughts uh, will be with him uh, at this difficult time. Uh, and also, I can confirm to her that this government believes levelling up should apply equally everywhere across our United Kingdom. Urban and rural communities up and down the country will get the benefit of having the investment that they deserve, making sure that we can spread opportunity and ensure everyone has pride in the place that they call home. Uh, yeah, if you weren't aware of that story, it was that overnight there was that news that 18, at least 18 people, including Ukraine's interior minister, uh, his, uh, who's Dennis Monistri, uh, which uh, Alicia Combs was referring to, his deputy interior minister, uh, and uh, and others, other senior officials, are thought to have uh, died, including uh, three children. Uh, so that's why the, uh, the those tributes have been made there. Interesting, uh, given the story on the front of the Times today, Tim, about how uh, MPs in... Uh, uh, marginal seats have been told to stop using the phrase levelling up because nobody knows what it means. Alicia Cairns at pains to use it several times in her question. Uh, and then Rishi Sunak using it in his response. 
Uh, well, fancy that. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's become one of those catch-all terms. People sort of, you know, at least in Westminster, vaguely kind of aware of what it means. I don't think most people have ever really satisfactorily um, uh, felt that it's been pinned down to something meaningful for their communities. But, of course, MPs, if they get this money and get things built, can then make that argument to their local papers and their local TV channels and say, look, this is this is working. And I think when people start seeing things being built, they can kind of comprehend that that might be something to do with levelling up. Um, you know, uh, lots of people, even close allies of Boris Johnson, thought it was a nonsense phrase. Dominic Cummings always thought when he was in Downing Street that it was completely meaningless. Michael gave it a whole report trying to explain to us what levelling up was, and I don't think most people are much the wiser having read it. Um, so it's one of those terms which is sort of functionally meaningless to the public, but people kind of sense that they understand vaguely that it means chucking money to parts of the country that haven't had it before um they don't know what it means in practice and these grants are terribly important because they show what it means in practice um i mean uh, quite whether um, the people of alicia kearns's constituency are yearning for the borough market of the midlands um is something that um uh, perplexes me a little um that's a classic uh, zone one london reference um which may or may not have residents uh, in her own seat but um yeah, I mean, it's very um, pop very popular with people in Times Radio Towers because it's just across the road. But um, other other overpriced farmers markets are available. They are I indeed. Suppose, but levelling up um, is going to become this great big sort of contest in the Tory party. Um, uh, there's a whole new group been launched, which Simon Clark and lots of other people mm. who supported Liz Truss are getting behind. They've uh, had it now not just launch something, and Clark's just not just writing for the papers. They've even had a drinks do now, so it's now an official enterprise. Um, as soon as you have a drinks do, you're you're in business. Um, forty people gathered. Um, one of the unkind of comments was uh, that it was a list of forty people you wouldn't invite to a dinner party. Um, but <laughs> but um, these are um, you know MPs from the sort of. Uh, uh, Truscateer uh, wing of the Conservative Party we're going to hold Rishi Sunak's feet to the fire over levelling up um, and the same goes for people who supported Boris Johnson so you know this is an area where Sunak you know is going to be kept on his metal um, by his own party so it's interesting uh, when uh, MPs are standing up and, and making these demands you know in the chamber Absolutely. Well, we'll leave it there. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground there today, Tim. Lovely to see you. Hopefully, all being well, I will be uh, with you in the studio tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow, next week. Do, send, my, me, uh, do my... send me a picture of your secret Bridgen poster, won't you? I will do. Uh, yes, um, yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much for watching along on the uh, on the Times Radio YouTube channel as well. That brings us to the end of PMQ's Unpacked. My thanks to Tim Shipman, Chief Political Commentator of the Sunday Times. Uh, we'll be back next week doing it all again. Stay tuned. We'll do the quiz. Can you get to number 10 next here on Times Radio? Jane Garvey and Feig Lover on Times Radio with Kuoni, the travel experts you can trust. Join her, Feig Lover, and her, Jane Garvey, as together they explore the biggest stories making the headlines and the far less important ones just making us laugh. A peerless